So um, today we're going to talk about skeletal muscle relaxants. So um, we have to know some basic um, stuff uh, before learning about the neuromuscular blockers, okay, or the skeletal muscle relaxants. So we have to know um, the basic autonomic nervous system, physiology, um, cholinergic agonists and anticholinergics. So we have to revise um, cholinergic agonists and also the anticholinergics. Also revise the adrenergic agonist and also anti-adrenergics. Okay? So this will all be useful in order to understand this um, particular talk. So we have the tendons and then the muscle and the blood vessels and nerves. Okay, and then we have the one fascicle, which is the bundle of muscle fibers. And then we have the connective tissue. And then we have the one muscle fiber or cell. Okay, and then we have the myofibril. So this is a, a general um, overview of the muscle and it's what's contained inside the muscle okay so learning objectives um, we have to define the major groups of skeletal muscle relaxants and identify a drug from each group and describe the mechanism of action of depolarizing and non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers so you have to be able to list the common adverse effects related to the various commonly used muscle relaxants. Okay, back to skeletal muscle relaxants. So there are two main categories. We have the neuromuscular blockers and then the spas spasmolytics. Okay. The neuromuscular blockers are generally divided into two, the depolarizing and also the non-depolarizing. Okay, so we have depolarizing and non-depolarizing. And non-depolarizing can be divided into a few categories, including short acting, okay, long acting. So we can divide non-depolarizing at least into two categories. Okay, we'll talk about that um, in further details later on. And then we have the spas spasmolytics. Okay. Okay, before that, depolarizing, there's only one, which is succinylcholine, also known as succimetonium. Okay, succimetonium. So spasmolytics. Um, we have acute use, okay, for acute use, we have cyclobenzaprine. For chronic use, um, we have the ones that act in the CNS, okay, central nervous system action, such as baclofen, diazepam, and tizanidine. Okay, for the ones that act um, on the muscle directly is dentroline. Okay, and proline. So history and clinical use. So in 1942, um, Griffith and Johnson suggested that d tuberculin is safe during surgery. Of course, it has a history that is um, longer than much longer than that. Okay, maybe another 40, 30, 50 years before that. There are many events that happened, but to be to be concise, okay, we just go to the 1940s. Okay, and then in 1952, we have succinylcholine introduced. 1967, we have pancoronium. And in 1990, we have mevacurium, okay, which is the first short-acting, non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. Okay, mevacurium, the first short-acting, non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. So you try not to rem not try not to forget that the only depolarizing neurovascular blocker is succinylcholine. Okay, succinylcholine. 
So in the 90s, we have mevacorium introduced and also rocuronium, which is an intermediate acting, non depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. Okay, so this is a mevacorium is a short acting one. So rocuronium is an intermediate acting. So from this, you, you have some idea that the non depolarizing usually we divide it based on mainly its duration of action. Okay. <clears throat> So neuromuscular blockers, they're used routinely, routinely to facilitate, okay, to, to, to make easy endotracheal intubation and also mechanical ventilation, okay. So that's the use of neuromuscular blockers, okay, to help in intubation, endotracheal intubation and also mechanical ventilation. Ventilation is um, respiration okay so mechanical respiration means that we use a machine to help in um, a patient's respiration so once you do that that means um, that's what we call mechanical ventilation okay and also we need to use neuromuscular blocker, block, block blockers to maintain neuromuscular blockade during surgical procedures okay to maintain neuromuscular blockade, okay, to relax the muscles, to block the muscles from contracting during surgical procedures, okay, so that the patient is, um, the muscles are relaxed, okay, so that it's easy for the surgeon to um, cut on the, uh, the patient. So, um, so generally, when a patient is in a in a condition that requires um, an endotracheal tube to be inserted, okay, so this is called intubation, okay. So we put this in, okay, and so routinely we use the the left hand actually to do this, and then we insert this tube, okay. So this is of course a dummy, but this is just an exercise, okay. So the trachea, the inflated calf, tongue. Okay, so usually what we do is we put this in and then we use a syringe, okay, syringe here, and then um, inflate this thing, okay. That's what we do, okay, to secure the airway. This is what we call securing the airway. Because once you do this, your tongue will not drop backwards and block the airway, okay, because the patient is being unconscious, okay. It's either the patient is becoming unconscious or we have to induce unconsciousness in the patient, okay, due to certain reasons, okay. So vocal cord, esophagus, okay, trachea, so inflated calf, tongue, calf inflating tube, endotracheal tube. So this is the endotracheal tube going in, okay, inflated here, so in order for this to happen, usually we need to give um, a neuromuscular blocker, okay, a neuromuscular blocker. So we need to give a skeletal muscle relaxin to relax okay, the muscles here so that we can and, um, put this in. So this can be done um, in an emergency situation, maybe um, anywhere, okay at the site of emer emergency, for example, or it can be done in the emergency department, or it might be done in the wards, okay? And also, especially before surgery, okay? Before surgery, and if you want to do, to, if you want to give the patients, um, to give a patient general anesthesia, then we need to do this, okay? Usually, okay? So, a revision of the events at the neuromuscular junction, and also about a little bit on acetylcholine. So um, this is taken from letters, okay? Sodium, we have sodium here, and then we have the um, ion channel, the ion channel, so the gate, so sodium going in, okay? So this is the um, acetylcholine receptor, okay? So sodium going in. So this is just a quick recap of the receptor. How does 
how do people uh, depict or try to um, portray the um, the channel the receptor so we have so we have the lipid by layer here okay and then we have the receptor okay we have the nerve cells okay, another picture taken from Mayo um, Mayo Clinic um, so we have the neurotransmitters okay from in the vesicles being released outside and it then binds to the receptors another picture okay So this is just showing how um, the acetylcholine, okay, binding to the receptors on the muscle, okay, the vesicles, and we have the calcium ions, calcium channels, and then the antibodies, okay. So the antibodies that might act and act, um, upon the acetylcholine receptors in certain medical conditions, okay. We'll talk about that later on, but this is just. Um, so this is actually a drug, okay, a drug by a drug company. Okay, so we don't bother too much about the, the name of the drug, all that. But just just that focus on the picture itself, okay? The potassium channel, all that. Okay. And the cell codeine mainly. So when we talk about depolarizing agent, okay, actually agent, not agents, okay. There's only one, which is saxamethonium. Okay, also known as succinylcholine, scholine or sax. Okay, <clears throat> so it acts like a nicotinic agonist. Okay, a nicotinic agonist. Okay, and cause depolarization of the neuromuscular end plate. Okay, neuromus um, depolarization of the neuromuscular end plate. Okay, because when it opens the channel. Okay, so we have more positive ions going in, cations going inside the cell. Okay, and then we have, um, it becomes very, very positive. So we have depolarization. So it depolarizes the postsynaptic membrane, causing paralysis by inhibiting restoration of normal membrane polarity. Okay, so it depolarizes the postsynaptic membrane, causing paralysis by preventing okay preventing the restoration of normal membrane polarity okay so it doesn't allow the the membrane polarity to go back to normal okay so it depolarizes the postsynaptic membrane and this will cause paralysis okay you want weakness you want paralysis you want you don't want the muscles to contract okay so that's why we give saxamethonium. So um, saxamethonium will overstimulate the receptor. Okay. Overstimulate. Okay. Overstimulate the receptor. The receptors. And then it will desensitize the receptor. Okay. So we have two phases. Okay. Two phases involved in when you give saxamethonium. Saxamethonium. So we have the short term, which is a phase one, causing muscle fasciculations. Okay, and phase two involves desensitization. Okay, desensitization. You become no more sensitive to the actions of the, the drug. Okay, you become no more sensitive to the actions of the drug. So this you become refractory, okay, you become resistant. To subsequent stimulation. Okay, in phase two, you have you become resistant, you become refractory to subsequent stimulation, causing flaccid paralysis. Okay, you become weak, okay, you become paralyzed. Okay, of you have muscles par becoming paralyzed. Okay, uh, we'll continue in the next um, video.